Um, so welcome everybody. I'm Holly Cummins. I work for Red Hat. I'm an engineer with Red Hat. I help build Quarkus. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Quarkus today, but only only a little bit. Um, I think this is really a, a more general talk. Um, so let's start by asking, why are we here? Why are we in this talk rather than one of the other ones? Um, I think this comes back a little bit to the sort of the <laughs> the existential threat that we were hearing about in, in the keynote this morning. You know, there's sort of things that we do in our day job that seem mostly important. And then there's these kind of bigger issues that we sometimes try not to think about too much, because if we think about them too much, we realize we're all going to die a fiery death and everything is hopeless and we should just give up now. Um, so hopefully I'm going to be sort of in between those two. So a little bit bigger than day job, but a little bit smaller than existential threat and fiery apocalypse. Um, I think we all know <laughs> that there is a little bit of a climate situation. Um, it used to be sort of theoretical. We could see the temperature graphs, but we weren't really feeling it. Increasingly now we're feeling it. We're seeing more extreme weather events. We're seeing the sort of these scary floods. And so then the question is, okay, that's kind of bad. I, I can see that's kind of bad. Um, what does it have to do with me? And is there anything I can be doing to make this better? Well, the industry we work in actually has a very large carbon footprint. Um, if you look at the sort of the, the digital world as a whole, it produces about 3.7% of the world's carbon emissions, which is a lot. We tend to think of flying as the kind of the, the poster child for being really irresponsible with carbon. But if you look, flying is around 2% of the world's carbon. So our industry is almost double aviation in terms of its carbon footprint. So here, when we talk about the digital world, um, we talk about software. We're also talking about things like our phones, our laptops, our PlayStations. So what if we, if we try and be a little bit more realistic? Let's look at just data centers. So if you look just at data centers, they still use as much electricity as kind of a, a medium country. So here we are in the UK, it's a little bit over 1%. If you look at data centers, it's a little bit over 1%. So it's about the same amount of electricity as the whole of the UK. And I think looking just at data centers is actually being too specific. So if you consider data centers and also the cost of the network traffic going in and out of those data centers, you're up at 2%. So more, more than the UK, more than a bigger country like Brazil. And this really matters to us because as software engineers, what do we do? We write the things that are running in those da data centers. So this is kind of terrible because as software engineers, we're responsible for 2% for of this terrible situation. But I think it's also kind of good because that means as software engineers writing the things that run in the data centers, if we can make a difference, that will be a big difference. Um, I saw something recently and they were talking about um, green IT and, and whether IT as an industry should be looking to do green things. And, and what they said was, yeah, we totally should, because for some of these other industries, like it's really hard to make a saving. You know, if you look at like agriculture, people still need to eat. You know, we can't say, oh, we will solve the climate problem by not eating. But with, with IT, like there are some really easy solutions for us. And more generally, I think, I talked at the beginning about, you know, sort of existential doom and, and fiery apocalypse, but I think it's not really helpful to think about those because if we start, if we start with fiery apocalypse, then we end up going, oh, well, fiery apocalypse, we're all doomed. There's nothing that we can do. But actually, there are so many things that we can do. So it's really important, I think, to start from a starting point of there are things we can do and we should be doing them. So then the question is, okay, are there things that we can do? What, what are the things that we can do? Um, and should we be doing them? Well, should we reduce our greenhouse gases? Like, yeah. Um, it's clearly the right thing to do. 
Um, but but as well, when you're when you're sort of talking to the larger business about this, there are so many business benefits to reducing greenhouse gases. For one thing, it saves money, and I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, another thing that businesses are increasingly caring about is their ESG score. So more and more businesses are reporting on their their environmental and social governance, and if they can show that they're doing well at this, that helps. Um, it helps in a number of ways. One is it gives them a competitive advantage because a lot of businesses are trying to, they want to improve their ESG score. So when they make their purchasing decisions, they want another business with a higher ESG score. Um, but also in terms of recruitment, increasingly now, all of us, we don't want to just work for the place that pays us the most. We want to work for a place whose values align with our own. And so we want to be working for some place that's doing a little bit more to save the world than to destroy the world. So it's really good for business to, to be doing this. But then that comes back to, okay, so we, we think trying to reduce our greenhouse gases is the right thing to do, but what do we actually do in practical terms? So how many of you have um, looked at the website um, Green Dot Principles? Yeah, one hand. There's, there's a, a website um, that sort of sets out principles for green software engineering. And I've looked at it many times. And they've got nine principles. Because when you're trying to do a, a model for something, there's always a balance between making something that's really comprehensive and accurate and making something that's useful to mere mortals. And this, this model with nine things in it, I always sort of found a bit like, I'm sure it's very thorough, but this doesn't actually tell me what to do. Um, and more recently, the Green Software Foundation have been working on, on their model, which is a little bit more simple and easy to understand. Um, so I quite like their model just because it, it seems to apply better to, to me and the kind of things that I'll be doing in my job. So they have three things that you need to look at, which is good because three as a number, much easier to hold in your head than, than nine. So the first thing is carbon awareness. So this is really about where your workload is running and when your workload is running. The next thing to look at is hardware efficiency. So two things that really influence that are elasticity and utilization. And I'll come back to those terms. And then the last thing is the electricity efficiency. So this is really about the code that's running on, on your hardware. So that's about like, have you written a really cool, efficient algorithm? And also what stack are you running on? So let's start with the carbon awareness. What this really, this is sort of, if you're looking at this, this is the first thing to look at because it can be so easy and it can be such a big win because this is really about the source of your electricity. We sometimes think of electricity as kind of green, like, you know, we're all switching from um, petrol cars to electric cars because they're greener, but it depends what the source of that electricity was. And quite a lot of the world's electricity, quite a lot of the UK's electricity still actually comes from burning fossil fuels. Um, and in particular, quite a lot of it comes from burning coal, which is about the most environmentally destructive way you can generate electricity. So how do you know if you've got the like the cuddly green electricity or the, the evil carbon electricity, coal electricity? A really good rule of thumb is to look at the location of your data center. So in some parts of the world, like in South Africa, for example, there's a lot of coal burning um, in other parts of the, of the world, just because they have different resource mixes. So for example, in the Nordics, they tend to have a lot of wind power and other renewables. Um, this map, I, I would not take this map and use this as the, <laughs> the basis for your sourcing de decisions, um, but you can be more precise. So there's a site called electricitymaps.com and you can look at it and it's actually quite fun just to browse. I haven't really captured it with um, the static picture, but you can sort of have a zoom around and so you can see again, like in the UK, like we could be worse, but we could also be a lot better. Um, and then, you know, some parts that like Ontario and Quebec, for example, they tend to do really well. And one thing I want to draw your attention to 
is this bit. So that is Virginia. And almost a huge number of the data centers in the United States, and actually a huge number of the data centers, sort of the, the, the global data center population, is in Virginia. And the reason they're in Virginia is for two reasons. One is, I haven't, um, I haven't drawn it here, but the transatlantic data pipe is a big cable, and it sort of comes in and it goes in at Virginia. So it makes sense to have your data center right next to the cable. The other thing is that Virginia is really blessed with natural resources. And the natural resource that Virginia is really blessed with is coal. And so that means that you have these data centers and you have this wonderful, very local source of energy. That seemed like a really great idea 30 years ago. It seems like a much less good idea now, but it's sort of quite hard to change. So <laughs> workloads in Virginia tend to be running on coal which is kind of terrible. Um, and the good news is it's really easy to change in general, you know, that we can take our workloads and we can shift them. So when you're, I think often, like I've done this so many times, when you're provisioning a new service and it just goes, where do you want it? And you go US East 1, US East 1, because that's like at the top of the menu, that's the most popular choice. Don't choose US East 1, because that's in general in Virginia running on coal. And more generally, when you're provisioning something, a cloud or a service or wherever, look at the sustainability information for the region before you choose. And if that's really hard, like if you have to kind of go digging and then like look at electricity maps, maybe like maybe choose a cloud provider that actually helps you with that. The other thing that matters is the time of day. Um, so natural energy or renewable energy sources rather, um, are what's known as intermittent. And that means that with the exception of a few things like hydroelectricity, like <laughs> I bet you never knew solar power only works in the day, right? Like, and wind power tends to be stronger at night, but it also tends to be just completely random and you're at the mercy of the elements. Um, so when you're deciding what workload to run, or when, when to work, run your workload, think about like, okay, well, this is a solar powered region, so I should try and do it in the day, or this is something that actually, I don't really care about the latency, so I can run it as a batch job overnight and take advantage of the fact that not many other people are using electricity. Um, and the not many other people are using electricity matters a lot because for almost all grids, what they'll do is they'll have their renewables. And then if there's too much demand, they'll go to the fossil fuel. So they'll fire up the coal plants. So trying to keep this, the how much energy we're using stable makes a big difference. The other thing that we can do is we can move our workloads around. So this is something that the cloud makes really easy. If in, at some times of day we should be running in the Nordics and other times of day we should be running in Quebec, we're now starting to see this sort of carbon aware dispatching. So you'll have, you don't want to be doing it manually, but you want to have some tooling that helps you just shuttle your workload around. And it's something that the cloud is exactly suited for, this kind of portable workload. Um, it's not trivial. There definitely is like a data problem here to try and match the demand to where the energy is coming from. And then of course, there's the orchestration aspect as well. Your workload has to tolerate being moved and you have to have something to, to help you move it. The next thing that to think about once you've once you've sorted out not running in Virginia, um, the next thing to think about is your hardware efficiency. So I mentioned elasticity and utilization. And we tend to think of the cloud as something that just solves the problem of elasticity. So elasticity is how easily you can scale your workload up and how easily you can scale it down. And I love this quote from Corey Quinn. He says, the beauty of the cloud is in its elasticity. It lets you scale up to meet traffic demands. And then when that traffic wanes, you can keep your scaled up environment running in perpetuity to help send some engineer's kids to college. Because this is what we all tend to do. And even, even if you use something like Kubernetes auto scaling, it tends to have a bias towards 
scaling up really eagerly, but being reluctant to scale down because nobody wants to write the auto scaling algorithm that causes outages because it was too keen to scale down. So there's sort of there's a, a natural tendency, I think, for all of us out of both wanting to have high availability so that we don't get fired and also kind of laziness and forgetfulness to keep workloads scaled up more than they need to. But we can make a really big difference just by putting in some quite basic elasticity and some quite basic scale down. Um, so I heard a, a, a story, they were using AWS and they, they just wrote a little script so that instead of keeping the applications running all the time, <laughs> they just turned them off at night and it came up in the morning and they reduced their cloud bill by 30%, which is kind of huge. Um, Tom Cools, who's actually pronouncing his name Tom Coles, I think, um, he's speaking here and he was telling me a story that his wife um, works for a school. And again, she wrote like a little shell script to turn the school's computers off overnight and she saved the school 12,000 euros which is such a huge amount. And it's so, it's so easy, right? Like this isn't, you know, a huge multi, you know, service thing. This is just like a little bit of scripting. And we really, really need this kind of scripting um, because servers that aren't doing anything are a huge, huge proportion of all of the servers. Um, so in, they did a survey, and um, they've actually done a, a few surveys, um, sort of repeating the methodology. And they looked at 16,000 servers, and they found a quarter of them were doing no useful work. And by no useful work, I don't mean that they were serving cat pictures. What I mean is that for six months, which is a really long time, not a single thing had gone into that server or out of that server. So it was really like it had no reason at all to exist. And they were like, how did this happen? Why do we have these servers that are doing nothing? And they're like, well, maybe someone forgot to turn them off, um, which I have like done this so many times. Um, and then if you, if you change the bar a little bit, and instead of looking at the ones that aren't doing nothing at all, if you look at the ones that aren't doing much, it's even worse. So 29% of the servers were at active less than 5% of the time. So this means that if you count at the 25 and the 29, you've basically got two thirds of the world's servers doing almost nothing and consuming a whole bunch of electricity and a whole bunch of hardware to do it. So I mentioned, I mentioned no one wants to be the one who writes the algorithm that, that turns something off when it shouldn't have. Um, turning applications off is kind of scary. <laughs> It's no one will fire us for leaving it on, but someone might fire us if we turned it off. And it, I, um, I heard another story. They, it was um, a CIO office, and they were sort of doing a cleanup of their internal systems. And there was this box that wasn't labeled, and they couldn't find anybody who owned it. So they're like, okay, well, let's tidy it up, save the planet. Um, and they turned it off. And it turned out that this box had been mis misassigned into the internal network. And it was actually running the backbone. Uh, so this was a strategic outsourcing business. It was running the backbone of one of their clients' networks. So they like pulled the plug. And then the phone started lighting up with the client going, why is our internet suddenly broken? What have you done? Um, so that there is a risk. But I think one of the things that we should be looking to as an industry is to try and lower this risk. So if you think about a light switch, that's kind of the, the ultimate elasticity. Like when you go into a room, you never think, should I, you know, should I, if I turn the light switch on, will it work? Will the light come on? You just know it's going to come on and it's going to work, which means when you leave the room, you just turn the light switch off without like kind of anxiety of like, am I going to get fired because I turned the light switch off? You know, will it work next time? And then, you know, when you get in institutions, you don't even have a manual light switch. You just have the motion sensor so that if you're not doing anything, the lights turn off. And I think we want to kind of get to that with our systems so that you can have it so that you can turn these things off and you can turn them on again. And like, it comes up fast so you don't have like, oh, well, we're going to turn the servers on and 10 minutes later we might be able to do some work. It's got to be fast. 
And it's got to be reliable. It's actually got to work. Um, so technically, that means that the server, the systems are idempotent. They behave the same way when they, they come back up. And they have to be resilient. Um, so this idea of just having a little more, bit more confidently turning things off and confidently turning things on, um, I am calling light switch ops. So far, no one else is talking about light switch ops, but I will have to see. But I did just get um, exciting news the other day because uh, do any of you know Anne Curry? No. So um, so Anne Curry um, does a lot of work on sustainability and IT in the UK, um, and she, along with a few others, is writing the O'Reilly book on sustainability. And she messaged me to say, hey, I'm going to mention light switch ops in the O'Reilly book on sustainability. So at that point, I will be famous and light switch ops will be a thing. Um, maybe. <laughs> so the last thing to think about is the electricity efficiency. So I think for a, lo a lot of us who are sort of not on the ops side, but who are more on the code side, this is the bit where we feel we can make the biggest difference. Um, so efficiency really is about doing more with less. It's about having computer programs that use the least energy. And there's a whole bunch of things that influence this. One is the algorithms. But the other thing is the programming languages. So some programming languages use very little energy. And some programming languages use a ton of en energy. And I think this is quite good because everybody loves a language war, right? And we all know the language that we think the people who use that really don't even deserve the name of software engineers and we can laugh at them in the pub. And we, we would do that anyway, but now we have an extra reason to laugh at them, which is you're stupid, your language sucks, and you're destroying the planet. Ha ha ha. Um, and th there's data that we can use to justify at least the, uh, the third assertion. Um, so there's this paper that sort of made the rounds of the internet a few years ago. I would take all of this with a bit of caution. There's a ho the, they ran a series of microbenchmarks, so it's a starting point, but of course none of us actually run microbenchmarks for, for our work. Um, so there is going to be some, you know, some use cases where maybe this is different. But the results that they found are Python, absolutely horrifying in terms of its um, energy efficiency. And then you say, but wait a minute, isn't Python running all of the machine learning models for like all of the world? Um, and the answer is, in general, Python is sort of a wrapper. And then the actual model is running in a lower level language. Um, JavaScript, surprisingly OK, actually. Um, interestingly, I think sometimes we think about Go as kind of like a, a faster relative of um, Java and a more efficient relative of Java. Go is, even though Go is a compiled language and Java is sort of interpreted, Java is more efficient than Go. Um, and then at the top we have C and Rust, which are basically the same. So if you want those, those specific numbers, there's a few others that you can pull out here. So for example, PHP, near the bottom, as, as we would expect, because we all love to laugh at PHP. Um, whoops, and yeah, Java near the top. Um, the other thing, sorry, let me go back. So another thing that we can look at, because we're all probably, are we all Java programmers here? Yeah. Um, when you look at Java in particular, so you say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to switch to Rust because Rust looks hard. Um, and I'm definitely not going to switch to C because C looks even harder and it's not even, that doesn't have the memory safety. Um, what can I do with my Java to make it more efficient? There was another paper where they just sort of twiddled the knobs on the JVM parameters to see what it did. Um, and they were able to make a difference of 100%. So basically a factor of two, just by twiddling the knobs. So then the question is, if your JVM parameter is just twiddling those knobs on like, you know, what garbage collection mode and that kind of thing can make that much difference. The JVM is only the very bottom of our stack and we have a whole bunch of stuff on top of it. What difference does that stuff make? So this is where Quarkus comes in. Um, I, I work on Quarkus. Um, Quarkus is supersonic subatomic Java, um, which is 
sort of a, a, a way of saying just it's really small and it's really light and it's really fast. And we have um, these really quite good performance numbers. So compared to a traditional cloud native stack, even if you run Quarkus um, as a JVM application rather than a natively compiled binary, it's going to use like half the memory. And if you compile it down as a native application, then it's going to use like 10% of the memory. Um, and similarly, your first response time as as a JVM as, sorry, as a native application, it's faster to start than a light bulb. On JVM, it's still really quite ridiculously fast. So then the question we had was, well, okay, so we know it's really fast, but does being small and fast translate to a reduced carbon footprint? And of course, this is the kind of thing you don't want to, intuition is good for some things, but when you're trying to optimize, you have to measure, measure, don't guess, measure, don't guess. Um, it turns out measuring is a very good thing in theory, um, but measuring carbon is hard, which is why we hadn't done it until relatively recently. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to measure your power usage. Uh, the most accurate way to do this is to actually, at this point where it goes into the wall, you can measure how much power is coming out of the wall. Um, that has some disadvantages, like so it's really thorough, but you actually have to have access to the wall and then it's sort of going to be like, and you need the right equipment and then, you know, there's going to be sort of numbers so you actually probably have to be like sat there reading the numbers off the thing and writing them in a notebook and nobody wants to do that. Um, so instead, what you can do is Intel have a thing called Rappel, which allows you to programmatically measure how much energy the system is using. It doesn't catch everything, but it's a pretty good approximation. Um, what neither the wall power nor RAPL capture is the fact that data also costs carbon. So when, when your data goes through the network, all of those network switches are actually tiny little computers that are also using CPU. So you do kind of need to take that into account. But that assumes that you actually have your machine. If your machine is in the cloud, then really in the cloud, it's a black box. That's the whole point of the cloud, is that your machine is a black box. So then that means it's really hard to try and figure out, like you definitely don't have access to the wall. You probably don't even have access to Rappel. So what do you do? If you know the load of the machine, you can get quite a long way because there's some data sets that allow you to work from that load and the instance type that you're using to actually figure out how much energy it's using. Once you have the energy usage, you can then look at what region you're in using the published energy mixes and convert that into a carbon. Unfortunately, between each cloud provider, they have a different methodology for sharing their carbon. So you can't really compare apples to apples across the energy providers, but again, at least it's a start. And the last thing that you need to think about is the embedded carbon. So there's the, when you're running software, there's the actual electricity it's running, but then there's also the hardware that it's running on. And hardware takes a lot of carbon to manufacture, and then a lot of other resources as well, like water and that kind of minerals. Um, so you need to consider that. This is all very comprehensive, but it's also really hard. Um, so if you're just trying to optimize, rather than trying to make a statement, you know, in a, in that you're going to put out externally, there are some simpler models that you can use. One of my favorites is the what I call the Vroom model. No one else calls this the Vroom model. Um, if you go back to this table that I had from, from the programming language comparison, you can see there's two columns. There's the energy and there's the time. So this is how long it took to chew through the benchmark. So it's really a performance measure. If you look at the sort of the ordering of these and the ordering of these, they're basically exactly the same. So there's a few little bits where it varies, but like as a rule of thumb, it's pretty good to say that if it doesn't take much time to execute, it's not using much energy, as long as you keep everything else the same. Obviously, if you put it on six CPUs instead of one CPU and it goes faster, you haven't necessarily saved. But if you're just changing your code, faster execution time means lower carbon in general. Another model that you can use is the economic model. 
And the full name for this is the Economic Input-Output Lifecycle Assessment, which is why we call it the economic model, because nobody wants to say that. And what this says is that if you reduce your cloud spend or your hardware spend or your electricity bill, you're probably reducing your carbon footprint as long as you keep other things the same. Again, there are some exceptions to this. So, for example, with um, some of the AWS Lambda, they have different pricing models, and some of the pricing models have a lot of the processing being done somewhere where you don't pay for it and you don't see it. But again, if you keep everything else the same, and if you reduce your bill, you're probably saving carbon. Now, when I show these models, people who actually are experts in the area start twitching. Um, and, you know, I can see them sort of going as, as they're, you know, getting upset. Um, but I think these models, if you really drill into the details, there's points where they fall down. But we don't need to be making the world's most precise carbon model. We just need to be optimizing what we're doing and going basically in the right direction. And these models are so easy and accessible that I think they're useful. Um, I think it, it comes back down a little bit to, um, to what we were you know, hearing in the keynote, that sometimes not being an expert allows us to come up with these sort of you know, imposter level approximations that are actually, for our purposes, more useful than a really, really mathematically accurate model. So, back to Quarkus. When we, um, when we did these measurements, and we did actually do them with a proper methodology, we did it with the, the RAPL measurements, not, <laughs> not just it's cheaper. Um, actually, I tell a lie. We first did it just with the economic model. Um, so we did some experiments a couple of years ago, and we didn't want to run just micro benchmarks. We wanted to run a real workload over a significant period of time. So we took a workload and we ran it for 20 days on a couple of dis different instances. And what we found was if we ran the sort of the, the legacy framework, um, we needed a T2 medium instance. But with Quarkus, on both JVM and native, we were able to get away with a T2 micro instance. So we can go using the data set from that instance information to carbon information. And you can see it's basically the trend is the same. So our carbon is much, much lower with Quarkus than it is with the traditional framework. So this was kind of, we call this a density test. So it was really looking at how many instances can I pack onto a typical cloud virtualization. And Quarkus allows you to pack more instances on. And so then that means your carbon footprint is cut by about half. And we see similar stories from customers as well. So we get, you know, um, Vodafone Greece, for example, have been talking about how they had amazing cost savings because they were able to reduce how many cloud instances they were using with Quarkus. So that was based on um, working from the instance and the load. What if we actually do with the RAPL measurements, so the most precise measurements? So here again, we see a similar pattern. So what we did is we scaled up the requests per second and we saw how much energy the system was using, which we can convert to carbon. And so on this graph, lower is better. So you can see that Quarkus JVM used the lowest amount of energy, Quarkus native was next, and then the legacy framework on JVM and on native. So you can see that the legacy framework on native actually uses so much energy that you probably need to have a really good reason to be using that. So that's just at a single instance, and the line ends when it conked out, when it couldn't handle any more load. If you want to handle more load, you need to add more instances. So we did that as well. And again, you can see, so this is sort of a more smooth line. And Quarkus on JVM used the lowest amount of carbon. So it's always reassuring when you do something in two different ways with two different methodologies and get more or less the same answer. So here again, we saw that Quarkus cut carbon by around two or three. One interesting thing here is that when you run Quarkus as a natively compiled binary, it's so exciting because it starts so fast and it has such a tiny footprint. But because the throughput was lower, 
we saw that it actually consumed, for this kind of generic use case, it consumed more carbon than the JVM. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But just in general, did Quarkus reduce carbon emissions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just sort of passively, without doing anything else, if you switch to Quarkus, you're saving time, you're saving money, and you're also saving about half your carbon. Um, and I've seen Eric, who's there, do a demo, which, are you doing it th this week too? Depends on which demo you're doing. The, um, the one where you convert from Spring to Quarkus, yeah. So he's got a cute little demo where he just swaps out a few libraries in his Spring application, converts it to Quarkus, and even though he hasn't really changed any of the code at all, except for like a little bit of test code, it's running faster and with lower carbon. So this can be really quite cheap and easy to do. Talk today. Talk today. What time? Uh, two something. Two something. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's Eric D'Andrea. Um, so I mentioned the, the results were surprising for native. Certainly when I got the, the results back, I was like, what? Surely this is wrong. And then I had, we went back and forth a few times. But sort of as, as a reminder of like when you want, want, might want to use native compilation in general. Um, the use case is like if you've got kind of a low workload, so throughput's not really the bottleneck, or maybe you're resource constrained or you want to run an old hardware or something like that, or you, you, um, you're sort of redeploying the application really often, so you know that your JVM is never going to get time to warm up. Um, and then obviously serverless is sort of the, the classic use case for native. Whereas if on the JVM, if you've got like a high workload, you're better off with JVM. Or if you're leaving this thing up and running for a long time, you're better off with JVM. Or again, if just because like your organizational culture is that you tend to put deploy things and then leave them up for a long time because the business feels a bit uncomfortable about like doing that with its workloads, then you know maybe JVM is a, a better fit. So for carbon, that's the use cases. And you'll notice those were exactly the same. Um, so if it, it's the same thing, like as I was mentioning before with the Vroom model, that if you optimize your cost and your application performance, you're actually basically going to be optimizing carbon as well in most cases. Another thing to think about with, with native is we sometimes say, like, should I be native or should I be JVM? But it's not an either or. Um, certainly what Quarkus will allow you to do is you have the same code base and then you just have a compile flag to compile it to native. So you can have most of your stuff running on native and then you can have kind of like cloud burst, or sorry, most of it running on JVM and then you can have cloud bursting to really rapidly spin up native instances if you find your workload is higher than you expected. Another cool use case for native um, that I've seen is CLIs. So Writing CLIs is in general not much fun, but you can run CLI, you can write CLIs in native, in Java with Pico CLI. And then when they're compiled natively, they start up so fast that you can actually do tab assist on the command line with your native Java application. And I don't, I don't have any evidence for this, but I kind of feel that intuitively, like doing something by a CLI is going to be more carbon efficient than doing it by the UI if there's not another reason to use the UI. So, that's another thing to think about. I mentioned that native Quarkus starts faster than a light bulb, which is incredibly cool. Um, but you do kind of have to think about like, okay, but how am I using this? Because starting faster than a light bulb doesn't really help you that much if you only start it once every six months. So you have to think about how you're using it. And if you are able to get that high elasticity and that light switch ops, then native Quarkus is awesome. Otherwise, maybe JVM and that kind of model is, is going to be better. So there's a few ways that Quarkus helps with carbon, which I think kind of echo back what I started with of the green software principles of, of the different ways that you can do it. So that your algorithm, your electricity usage, just out of the box, you kind of get that as a passive benefit. But then there's other things that you could be doing, but you have to kind of take an action to do them. So it depends on the people, it depends on how you do your ops. And that's that, you know, you could go for smaller machines, but you have to have someone willing to say, okay, yeah, let's change our provisioning. Let's not just provision the same way we always have. Or you could do more scale up and scale down, but you have to do the ops work to make that happen. So 
so I, I started off by talking about doom and, and despair, um, but I'm hoping that actually this is kind of positive because the if you remember the room model, I think that's kind of surprising because it's it's not the normal mental model that we have when we think about efficiency and when we think about carbon saving. So I recently had to replace my car. And what I really, really wanted was the one with the really big engine. Um, I couldn't get an electric car because I couldn't charge it. So I wanted the one with the, you know, the big engine that was going to go vroom. But I was like, well, that would be a bit hypocritical since I speak about sustainability. I need to get the very sensible car with a small engine that goes putt, 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 putt. And it was so disappointing. But with software, it's actually the opposite. Because efficiency means that you're sort of doing more with less, having that high throughput software, it's the one that's going vroom, 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 vroom. And it's also saving the planet, which is kind of awesome because there's no sacrifice involved. So yeah, we do need to, to change our mental model. I think another thing that we need to just adjust our mental model for really is when we think about should we be doing this? So in that, in that model there, one of the things that I think is missing is utility, which is, is this making someone happy? Are we actually getting any value from this? And apparently, a, a good portion of, of YouTube usage is people who want to listen to a song, but it's quite hard work to go somewhere else. So they go to YouTube, find the video for the song, stream it, and then have it, the video in the background and just listening to the song, and it's so wasteful. And so there's sort of like, could we just be changing how we do things to actually meet the actual user need, which is listening to a song, without all of the waste of streaming the video, which costs far more carbon than the actual song. And that, you know, there's loads of other things that we do that we think, do we actually need to be doing this? And again, I think, I think thinking about it in that way is really good because what we should be doing is not trimming out things that we actually want and care about. We should just be trimming out things that we didn't even want in the first place, trimming out waste. And that's, you know, that's not something that we're going to regret. So there's this idea of no regret solutions. Another way of, of thinking about this is sometimes it's called co-benefits. Um, I sometimes talk about the double win, but I'm never sure if that's actually very clear. Um, Win-win maybe is a little bit clearer. Um, I think Americans sometimes talk about win squared, but that I'm not sure that's really very clear. Um, one plus one equals three, but then you ha really have to sort of explain what you're talking about, which is kind of not what you wanted to be doing. Um, again, you know, a twofer is an American term, but it sort of needs explaining here. Um, someone suggested that the best name was the Überwinden, which sounds incredibly cool if you don't speak German. But unfortunately, if you do actually speak German, it means something completely different. Yeah, there's someone shaking. Every time I give this talk, there'll be at least one person who speaks German in the audience who's like shaking their head and going, no, 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 just take it out of the slides. It doesn't work. Um, sometimes, again, you know, sometimes I talk about the extra win. Um, but what all of these are sort of trying and actually totally failing to get across is this idea that climate solutions, they can make everything better. So it's not just saving the world. It's, it's also making everything else better. So like with the zombie servers, as well as being environmentally annoying, they reckon that 27 billion almost of cloud spend is just totally wasted. And if you think what your company could do with 27 billion, it's such a huge amount. And, and you know, we see this sort of across the board. So for example, if you turn things off, it saves money. Even something like renewable energy. Renewable energy is way, way cheaper than coal-fired fired energy. It's about nine times cheaper. So what that means is that if you host in Montreal, where the energy is greener, it uses 88% less carbon than hosting in London, and it's 15% cheaper. So again, you've got this kind of the, the Uber Vinden, if you're not German, or the, the win-win, <laughs> if you are, you know, it's sort of, it's making everything better. Um, and so I really like, I, I, 
I really like the Drawdown Project, and um, Jonathan Foley leads it. And I love this quote because he says, climate solutions are just better ways to do the things that we already want to do. So like, unless you're a major shareholder in an oil company or something, then most climate solutions will make your life and your community better. So like, we definitely, you know, we see this with Quarkus, we get when people try Quarkus, they're like, this is really awesome. I, I get that developer joy. That's one of the things that we, we try for. So I've kind of got the carbon saving and my life as a developer is happier. And again, you know, that's across, across the board with a lot of these things. So it's not like hair shirts and kind of, you know, I'm going to sacrifice myself to save the environment, unless except for the car. <laughs> you know, it, it's actually something better. And actually, even with the car, Electric cars, they accelerate really, really fast. They go vroom. So they're awesome if you have somewhere to charge them. So to summarize, if you do nothing else, choose your hosting wisely. Um, but more generally, like as, as individual consumers, but then also as decision makers or decision influencers in our company, there is buying power that will influence other businesses to do the right thing. So use that power to ask the questions about whether it's green, encourage the greener choice. This is embrace light switch ops, turn things off when you're not using them, ideally automatically. Choose an energy efficient framework because it's going to make a really big difference. And the best thing is all of this makes us better off than we were before anyway. So with that, I think I've got about five minutes for questions. And those are the slides, if anybody would like them. Thank you very much. Oh, and there's a, there's a microphone on, on the prowl for slides, for questions, rather. <laughs> Any questions? Oh no, oh rubbish. I had a broken QR code and I replaced it this morning and I thought it was a working QR code, but I didn't actually test my QR code. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, if you go to hollycummins.com and then there's like a talk section and then there will be a DevOps UK thing. That is, that is sad. <laughs> so a small question then. If you turn off your application, like uh, for instance in, uh, in a cloud provider, the cloud provider still needs to have that server running for another instance that comes in, for maybe another party. But they will leave that server on. So you're not spending that much on uh, uh, carbon, but the cloud provider is. Are they automatically turning off machines? No. So that that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so just because you're not getting build for the instance, just because you don't see the instance doesn't mean it's turned off. Um, so there's, and we definitely see this, for example, with, with serverless, the, um, like the orchestration costs of serverless and the sort of the extra overhead that you have means that again, even though you see that your instance is only running for like 10 seconds a day, there's all this other machinery. Um, with, with the cloud instance that you give up, I think that the hope is that there will be some reuse. So you need the, the, the computers overnight, but then someone else will use them in the day. So the utilization of the whole system will be higher. But you're right that you definitely have to look. Well, it's really hard, right? Because ideally you would look at the utilization of the whole system, but then you have other things to be doing. So it is, it is a balance. Um, but you're right that if you, if you release the instance, there is a chance that it gets reused and there is a chance that it gets turned off. It's not guaranteed. Um, and if you don't release it, there's no chance. So I think that's the, that's the reason to release it and use the spot instances and, you know, that kind of thing. But you're right, it's not, it's not guaranteed. And certainly with serverless, how AWS used to solve the cold start problem is they would leave your instance running all of the time. So it wasn't really saving anything. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, 
from your point of view, what is the the, the um, a big idea behind Quarkus that make it so efficient? What yeah, what what Quarkus has done is. Um, Java applications used to be optimized for a non-cloud world. So the idea is that you could start your application and it would be so dynamic. So you had, you'd have a lot of reflection and then you'd have other things and you could have your application running in an application server for six months and it would never get taken down and you could replace every single part of that application. That's not how we run applications now and you're paying a tax for all of that dynamism. So what Quarkus did is it moved towards more of build time optimization and more of a closed world model. So you, you have to do that with native. Like if you're going to make a native application, you have to say, okay, this is, this is what I'm compiling and I'm not letting anything else in and I'm not being dynamic. But it turns out if you take those same techniques and actually just run it as a JVM application, you get a lot of the same savings, but you're also on the JVM and you have access to, the, to everything that the JVM has to offer. Thank you. And if, I think we've got, we've got a few Quarkus talks tomorrow. So if, if people did want to hear more about the sort of the, the thinking behind Quarkus and some of the optimizations, I'm sure one of the talks will be doing that, possibly Mark Little's talk. Um, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>